Stanford University. Thanks, Dan, and thanks everyone for your interest in this topic and this mini med series that um, Dan has so thoughtfully engineered uh, for this quarter. So it's good to see a, a good turnout. And probably we could spend all night talking about this video in the background of my title slide, but this is human embryonic stem cell derived cardiac myocytes in a two dimensional sheet. So heart cells in a dish, if you will. And what I want to talk about primarily today is kind of where do we need to go to have this be a useful regenerative therapy. Um, and now, even more so with the lights going down a bit, if you have a question or the term you don't understand, I'm going to encourage you to not just raise your hand, but to just say question, uh, because there's a really bright light there and it just got a lot darker, and I won't be able to see you. So <laughs> at least if you're you know, verbal and uh, active, I might be able to, to catch that. So. Um, Dan made reference to some of the things we do in our lab, so we're the microsystems lab, and kind of wanted to define what that means for you. So in this field, which is commonly called MEMS, microelectromechanical systems, this encompasses things, small sensors, small actuators, small force sensors of the kind that Dan just mentioned that we like to do, and even um, as simple as micro-patterning the surface chemistry. I'll show you a lot of that tonight. So getting cells to stick where you want them and not to stick where you don't is a, a lot of what we worry about in our collaboration for cardiovascular engineering. And <laughs> The kind of tools that we use actually to pattern things at the micro or nano scale are the same tools the integrated circuit industry uses. So I don't know how many people here work in, in the, it's Silicon Valley after all the silicon. Okay, so this is old hat for a lot of you then. Okay, um, and then is it, how about folks who don't work in engineering? What's the? All right, good. Okay, so uh, please shoot up your hands at, at any of the the terminology I'm going to throw at either engineering side or biology side. As an engineer, I mean, you heard my background, right? So an engineer coming to biology through my very patient um, and enthusiastic collaborators, I'm constantly learning vocabulary myself. And so if I've forgotten that I didn't know this word five years ago, um, please remind me uh, that, you know, like, I'm happy to, to work through that. So, you know, there's some notable examples of what are MEMS, what are the kind of devices. And what our lab does, even though I go to the MEMS conference faithfully every January, um, and hear about technology that is kind of driving the next generation, iPhones, cars, et cetera. Uh, we kind of take a different twist on it often to make devices to measure biological systems. But if you have an inkjet printer, then you have you know, a little MEMS no nozzle set on the end of that inkjet cartridge. Every cartridge you buy has a little silicon chip <coughs> with thousands of, uh, of little holes in it, basically, and a lot of electronics to help steer the droplets to make a picture for you. Um, if you drive a car with an airbag, then you have one of these accelerometers with these little moving comb fingers. And when you, you know, hit your brakes or get in a car crash, you know, that, there's a proof mass that, that moves in response, so just Newton's law. And then it changes the gap between two electrodes, and then we measure that uh, capacitance change and re refer it back to the acceleration that, that caused it. If you have an iPhone, when you tilt it and the screen turns, that's also an accelerometer. So it tells up from down, measures gravity essentially. Uh, this Projector is possibly a digital micro mirror display device, but it has thousands of these little tiny mirrors, um, individual pixels that are making this picture up here. And so these are all kind of from the magic of microfabrication, if you will. So they're made in kind of uh, layer by layer deposition of different materials and, and etch processes to pattern them. And then just to give you an idea of the history, if you will, of the MEMS field, I think it's a really fun field to work in uh, because when I go to these conferences, all the the big names, all the papers I've read, they're still there. They're still going to the conferences. So you can see this timeline really, actually it started here at Stanford. So we did a review of MEMS education at Stanford and we found that some of the earliest work was really you know, referring to using the silicon IC technology done here in the electrical engineering department at Stanford, Jim Angel and others. And that if you, these blue bars represent the time from for kind of first research reports, whether it was in kind of the good old days of Bell Labs or here at Stanford University or Westinghouse, to commercialization pressure sensors. So, uh, you know, ironically, I started getting involved with uh, folks in cardiovascular applications because of the interest in this little thing that's being threaded through a needle. That is actually a pressure sensor that can be put down uh, in a catheter, right? And so it can measure the pressure difference if you've got an arterial blockage, measure the pressure difference by putting this pressure sensor back and forth through there, find where the stent really should be. A couple years ago, Medicare actually authorized the use of this because it made such a dramatic difference in the outcomes of stent placement. Uh, so those kinds of things are very common now. If you go up to the hospital, uh, there's probably millions of, of these MEMS pressure sensors in various formats measuring pressure internally or externally. Um, lots of different examples. You know, uh, this is actually a chip that, that filters 
to keep your communication on the right frequency, so Sprint versus Verizon, et cetera, right? You have one of these in your phone that's specific to your carrier and allows you to tune in and reject all the other frequencies, so a very fine little uh, film bulk acoustic resonator, it's called. It's basically a, a frequency matching filter. Uh, microphones, more and more cell phones have little microphones. Each of these things, each of these chips would be about the size of an eraser on a pencil, just to give you a reference. Okay, so now, so MEMS is kind of where my background is in terms of my training, but when I joined the faculty, I discovered that some of the more interesting problems for small scale measurements and devices were actually in the biological realm. So often people call it biomechanics, which I'll sort of define biomechanics as, you know, measuring the mechanical properties of biological stuff, so we do that. But we're also very interested in something that is commonly called mechanobiology. Sounds like a subtle distinction, but that is how does biology feel about being poked or prodded, right? So there's kind of, we can poke it and measure a property, but actually cells have ability to not only sense force, but to react and remodel, and the heart is no different. So uh, you know, I've learned an awful lot about pressure overload hypertrophy and other forms of enlarging of the heart, um, thanks to Dan and other collaborators. And this is exactly an instance of cells in your heart responding to a change in the loading condition, whether it's through high blood pressure, exercise, uh, and whatnot, and actually changing the amount of stuff, if you will, that it has inside of it. So just kind of all cells have these kinds of components just in different types of structures. So they're, they're typically, I shouldn't say all cells, but most cells, right, have a, a, in us have a nucleus, mitochondria that are, you know, sort of the, the protein processing centers, they have, they have a, their own skeleton called the cytoskeleton. So a cell skeleton made up of something called actin gets bundled. And that's what's being imaged here by labeling different proteins in the cell so we can see the green of these actin bundles. And I'll show you some pictures of what heart cells or myocytes look like, but the actin is highly ordered. It's a very beautiful structure in a myocyte. In order for a myocyte to work properly, to do work in your heart, contract and pump blood, we would really like to preserve that kind of structure and not have it be arbitrary. So I'll talk more about that too. But that image, if you recall the video on the title slide, um, and think to what it looked like, the cells were not beating uniformly, right? I mean, it looked kind of neat and it's magical to see heart cells in a dish, but they aren't doing functional work. So parts of it are contracting at different times asynchronously. It might be more appropriate to call that arrhythmia in a dish. Right? So meaning we actually don't have a, a propagate, proper propagation electrical or mechanical across the dish. And so our goal is to figure out how to engineer systems, you know, the dish if you will, so that we can get cells looking like we want them to. Um, some of the ways that we have to interface with cells, and this is kind of a high, uh, high density terminology slide for some of the structures. But in addition to all the stuff inside the cell, cells like to stick together. So they have these cell-cell contacts through proteins um, that uh, are usually mediated by a protein called cadherin, which is actually just short for calcium mediated adhesion, right? Or, so, cadherin. And then we have these things that are called focal adhesion complexes. So, it's just a focus point where the cell actually sits down and interacts with a substrate or the extracellular matrix, the collagen, right? So, all the stuff, the sort of tissue, the supports tissue are in between the living cells. And cells actually secrete this ECM and they can remodel it. So, this whole part. Part and parcel of, say, a, an infarct or a heart attack damaged tissue uh, is actually scar tissue forming in the heart. And in order to be able to get that part of the heart to be functional again, we need to sort of either hijack or upregulate the processes of cells that allow them to correctly degrade and rebuild their matrix. So I'm often amazed by when you start to think about the time scale of events in the human body, it's phenomenal to think that in a matter of weeks in space, astronauts lose bone mass, right, because of this mechanobiology effect. So they've lost the mechanical input in the bones. We don't need to make new bone. Great, I'll make less of it. Then they come back to Earth and they've lost, you know, they've lost bone mass, measurable after weeks, um, a, a real health concern after months. By the same token, sort of this is why exercise, you know, impact loading exercise helps you maintain healthy bone mass and the like. But this is an example of cells responding and changing their extracellular matrix, changing what they do to their environment in response to the load that they see. So this could also have implications for disease, not, not, not just like cardiovascular diseases, but osteoporosis and the like. So understanding how cells interact with, create their what's called extracellular matrix, um, degrade it, rebuild it, is really important for a number of uh, disease states. And something that is amazing to me too, I want to point out before we leave the slide, is so these focal adhesions I mentioned, how cells interact with the rest of the you know, tissue structure that's not living around them, and these cell-cell junctions, the proteins that connect cells to each other, so you know, we'd want all those cells to be well-connected in the heart, 
they're all, lately we've discovered that they all have mechanically sensitive elements to them. So they all respond to force in the ways I was just describing to you. Um, so these, these little cells themselves are the most interesting force sensors, I guess is the, is the summary. And in fact, these proteins we're finding more and more are actually the reason for these, uh, each individual protein is mechanically sensitive. I have a question. Yeah. Uh, on the, uh, the bone mass thing, is it bone cell by bone cell that you need mechanical input, or is it sort of done as a group that you get growth of new bone? Wow, we could, we could spend all night talking about that um, <laughs> distinction. It's an excellent question. In fact, from a biomechanics community viewpoint, so where I sit over in biomechanics and mechanical engineering, there are many people who have traditionally studied at what's called a continuum macro scale model. So if I understand your question correctly, then kind of this global change. Uh, but there are other folks who are more, more and more studying the individual cells and discovering that they are, they are, they are in fact as a unit mechanically activated. Um, it turns out if you think about bone, bone is actually it's not, you know, bone in us is not dry, right? There's actually fluid. And so it's not just the loading of the mechanical structure, but maybe even the pumping of the fluid in the spaces in the, the bone structure. So I mean, we have all hopefully can visualize bone from, you know, the supermarket, right? From various animal products. Um, and it, it's not a 100% dense material. There's a lot of cellular structure in there, right? Uh, a lot of space. And so when you think about walking, you're actually pumping fluid in all those spaces. And so there is a school of thought that says that that may be one of the signals. It's actually these little flow channels in the bone that are stimulating. So does that answer your question? OK, great. Um, so this is just kind of a you know, big cartoon. And depending on the cell type, it's going to dictate what kind of, how it's going to respond to these different types of fates. So whether it's a bone cell um, or a heart cell. And if we're starting from these what are called undifferentiated, undecided cell types, so maybe you've sort of heard of something called mesenchymal stem cells, which are from the bone marrow. Um, and they have a little less pluripotency as a school of thought, that they can't become just everything as efficiently as, say, what's called an embryonic stem cell. And I know next week Joe Wu is going to be talking about stem cells for regeneration. So he'll be touching on a bit of this terminology. But there's even a newer class of pluripotent cells that can become other types of cells which are, we can make them from a patient's own cells. So they're called induced pluripotent cells. And that's really powerful because that means you don't have any of this uh, immune response, potentially, if we could figure out how to engineer these through these kind of factors to be the kind of cell type that we want. Um, and I'm gonna leave the discussion of the details of that kind of process to Joe's talk next week, but I'll, I'll mention a bit, because we, we collaborate with Joe Wu as well, so. Um, we're particularly interested, I should mention, as mechanical engineers in all these things that, that involve the mechanical signaling cascade. And at least to date, the, the way that induced pluripotent stem cells are made, the way they're induced, is completely biochemically. So it's more of a, uh, you know, giving them a signal to another type of receptor, a biochemical receptor. And we're interested in their, you know, the mechanical receptors. Question? So both. In fact, this, I think that's a good question leading into this slide. This is just a, a nice image from a review paper um, from Viola Vogel's lab uh, looking at this balance between the two. So this idea of a cell holding on right, to the mechanic, mechanical environment and through those mechanical adhesions experiencing sort of just the natural stretch right, that all of our body tissues do as we move and, and, and are dynamic throughout the day. But then there's also the chemical cues. Chemical cues which are often referred to as paracrine signaling. So cells are kind of secreting different biochemical cues, and they can be carried through the bloodstream, right, can be carried through the lymph system. Um, inflammatory response, you may have heard of uh, those being mediated by, by uh, cytokines, they're called a type, of protein, a type of protein that signals inflammation and then recruits white blood cells, right, to the rescue, if you will, or to, you know, create more inflammation. So that would be an example in terms of the cytokines or the inflammatory response of a purely chemical cue. But the idea of bone mass, right, and of course there is, you know, there is, a, it's, it's a bit of a chicken and egg problem because some of this mechanical signaling is obviously in terms of turning on different protein production or turning on different protein sites. I don't think I have any slides about this, but Viola's lab has been very active in the last few years with showing how some of these mechanisms might work. So this mechanical cue, imagine a protein like a slinky, right? And so as I pull on the slinky, you know, it's a spring essentially, when I pull on the slinky, there's a lot more places to stick my fingers in, right, into the slots as I open up. And this is very akin to protein mechanobiology. As I open up the protein, I find a lot more places for other proteins to bind. 
And so it's actually this interplay of the mechanical and the chemical together that I can actually have mechanics changing the chemical reactivity of, of particular proteins. And that's a very cool concept. Um, sort of says that there's two program responses for every protein, an unstressed state and a stressed state. And there's been a lot of work recently that says that just looking at cells in a dish, static, doesn't always capture the, the, the answer that, of how that cell might be responding in our bodies when it sees the normal mechanical state. Uh, so these are the kind of drawings, and I, I'm not at all a cell signaling expert, but the types of sensors that folks have been studying biochemically for quite a while, you know, again, sort of what are the receptors, you know, cadherins talk to cadherins for cell-cell contacts. Integrins are a class of protein that can lock on to ECM, the extracellular matrix, the collagen and the stuff in the surrounding tissue. So these are kind of, you know, kind of the input-output, if you will, or the, the mating um, slot A, tab B type of thing, right? How do, the, how do the cells actually plug and play into these, these signaling cascades? And so this is a kind of nice image overview that says, you know, actually, some of the, we've got a, on every cell, we have the potential to have receptors on the surface that respond because there's a flow, like a shear flow going over, there's fluid going over the surface, or that is a kind of lock and key receptor to a particular signaling molecule, so a biochemical receptor. Um, and, and this is kind of the, the school of thought now is that cell signaling is actually a multi-scale. And the other thing I kind of like uh, to point out, because I'm a mechanical engineer, is the scale of, of forces. Uh, so the kinds of small, when we're talking about stretching out the slinky, which is a protein, piconewtons. It takes piconewtons to stretch out most of the proteins in these cells. So this is an exquisite force sensor. Uh, you know, so thinking that, about... That, that give people a concept of what a piconewton is? Because sometimes I have a hard time getting my, my mind around what, what fraction of a newton... Yeah, so a kilogram, 2.2 pounds, right? And a, so a kilogram times gravity is one newton. So we're talking about if, if that's, you know, so two pounds is, is a newton, then pico newton 10 to the minus 12. Yeah, micro, so thinking about micro, do you get the idea of like one thousandth of something? So micro newton or micron, a thousandth of a meter. Human hair, a hundred microns. Single cell on the order of 10 to 100 microns. Most of them are 10 or smaller. Heart cells are, are enormous in the cell world, but you know, 100 microns, human hair size, individual heart cells. So that, just to give you an idea of the, the kind of scale, and these kind of measurements, and they've been being made, I'm teaching a freshman seminar this fall, and uh, that anything in the 90s, they're just like old, old technology, old science, <laughs> it's rather amusing, but you know, fairly recent, but I mean, these are, these are the kind of measurements people are making to understand where the forces, you know, how well do cells stick to each other? Um, the, the strongest, stickiest cells that I've seen reported in the literature are nanonewtons, 10 to the minus 9. So a million times smaller than, you know, kind of that, that two-pound weight um, you were just describing. I uh, want to give you a bit of an overview that in cell culture, so cells in a dish, we can start to think about changing the way cells mechanically, just the way they look, through putting those Factors. So I talked about the signaling through the lock and key chemical receptors and cell-cell contacts versus cell-substrate contacts. This is uh, from Kit Parker's lab. They put down the proteins that cells want to stick to on extracellular matrix. Uh, the sort of, you know, all the stuff that isn't cells, right? So when just our skin is even mostly dead, right? Dead material has been secreted by skin cells on the, on the outer surface. So putting down a pattern in a square, look what happens to the cell. The cell spreads out and it stretches those actin filaments, those stress bundles. The, you know, there's, a, there's a guy who refers, Don Ingbar refers to this as the tensegrity model, right? So it's integrity by tension. Think about pitching a tent when you go camping. So the cell, in order, you know, and this, this is when it, it settles onto this bottom of this dish in liquid and we've got pl proteins that have been patterned in the squares. Within a matter of minutes, cells have set up this kind of set up their tent, if you will. So their, their time scale of kind of sensing where their receptors are and the amount of force that they need to pull with is on that scale. And this is, this is just that um, fluorescent labeling, it's called, to recognize where, they, where are the actins, so where are those tent poles. These are all under tension, so these filaments are under tension. And that blue is a stain for the nucleus of the cell. And this is just um, a fibroblast. In fact, fibroblasts are the cells that are the, the key makers of the extracellular matrix in our body everywhere. There's all kinds of different fibroblasts, and they are the most populous cell in the heart, actually, cardiac fibroblasts. 
Uh, so how does that cell patterning work? Well, we, we make something that looks like an ink stamp, essentially. We make it out of rubber. PDMS is silicone rubber. It's the same stuff you might seal your windows with or seal an aquarium with. Basically bathroom caulk, right? A little more science grade. Make us pay more for it. Um, so then we stamp these little PDMS into the protein of interest, and then we stamp it onto the bottom of a petri dish or, or a glass slide, and then that's how we get those cells into those pretty patterns. I uh, wanted to give you an idea, because again, I'm interested in the mechanics of cells primarily. So we're the kind of scales, and so this is, I think this is a nice lead in. So Dan was asking about the you know, range we might talk about. So it's, again, cell size over here and displacement, you know, proteins being 1,000 times smaller than that. Uh, you know, this still being a millimeter over here, so, so tiny. And then there's a you know, bunch of different definitions, so more terminology again. But the types of things, uh, I'm not going to talk too much about cantilevers, but I'll pick one, you know, just to talk, since Dan mentioned that we like cantilevers. Something called atomic force microscopy is basically just measuring the deflection of a cantilever as I scan it over the surface, or the deflection of a cantilever, I bounce a laser beam off of it, and I know the stiffness of that little cantilever and it gives me a map of the surface of the cell, like the one we just saw in the last, the last picture, so I can actually get here. This has actually been captured by an atomic force microscope, so I'm getting a map of the topography. This is an image of the z-height of the cell. So that's one way in which we can measure very small displacements. Uh, and there's lots of other techniques that people have used, but you, know, you notice that, that they're really kind of, again, this is you know, thousands of a newton going down into you know, 10 to the minus 12 really small. Um, let's see, so how are some of these things, how do, we, how do people have conceived of measuring these? I'm just going to give you kind of just a soup of, of you know, very imaginative approaches to trying to apply known forces to cells and see how they respond to them. Um, this is from a lab at MIT. This is that atomic force microscope with a cantilever. I can scan the topography. Um, Kristen Van Vliet's lab did something I thought was really clever, and a lot of labs have done it since. They functionalize the surface with those same proteins that we patterned to make the cells stick where we want them before. And then we go fishing across the surface of the cell and figure out where the receptors are. So how many receptors does a cell have for that particular protein? Um, and this actually has you know, been very useful. Manish Butte here at Stanford has been using this, for instance, to scan cancer cells. So how cancerous is a cell, if you will? How many receptors does it have? So you can actually start to score something on it. Maybe it's metastatic potential by the number of receptors it has on the surface for these kind of um, inflammatory markers or, or metastatic markers. Here's another one where a, a you know, group basically was looking at how much force does it take to disrupt this cytoskeleton. And so this very elaborate micromachine device that they measure the force it takes right, as they're poking on a cell. And you know, again, I know I talked about it very quickly, but these little comb fingers that are the capacitor structures, so all of this business stuff, these little capacitive structures are there to make for an actuator and a sensor to measure forces very exquisitely. And what I like about this image is from Brad Nelson's lab, who's at ETH in Zurich. You see that there's actually stuff going on in three dimensions. So at the end of this cantilever, unlike an atomic force microscope that we use to scan over the surface of a cell and get a map of z-height as the cantilever interacts, they can actually do this in three dimensions. They're measuring force in x, y, and z at the micro scale, which is pretty cool. So they used this for pretty interesting uh, measurements where they looked at the difference in the stiffness of an embryo. Um, this is a, I can't remember what type of embryo it was, but it, they looked at it before and after fertilization. And so this is kind of getting to some really interesting discoveries about how life works, right? So once the embryo was fertilized, the stiffness, the permeability went up tenfold. So this is how life you know, perpetuates to not have errors in, in terms of it becomes impermeable to the next sperm. So the fertilization event is, is limited to a unique parent. Yeah? Well, if you place a, a muscle, will it tell you what direction it's traveling in? If you placed it on a muscle? Yeah, muscle cell. Okay. Yes, yeah. So that's one of the nice things about their particular XYZ sensor is if, if you were to bring that up against some kind of moving surface, you would actually get sort of a three-dimensional vector out of that. So it's a pretty cool device. And actually, in fact, they, they have a rather astonishing video that they showed at one of our conferences, but they glued a Drosophila to the end of this, and they were measuring different mutations in the ability of the Drosophila to respond to flight stimulus. A lot of groups that do their show movies to flies and then look at their flight response. And so they could measure you know, the three axis, the flight of the Drosophila in response to different obstacles that were presented to the, to the flies in, in flight.
So pretty, pretty fantastic um, force measurements. Something that's more commonly used for individual cells, though, is actually to take an array of these little cantilevers. And again, we're measuring displacements of the cantilevers. We're really measuring the displacement of cantilevers uh, by looking from the top and seeing how the top of these individual pillars moves. So they all, all these circles are the top surface of an array of lots of little cylinders, little columns. And when the cells pull on, you see that little column got pulled over. So this is an example of cells exerting force on their environment, right? And heart cells, of course, you know, want to exert. We, we, would, we would like healthy heart cells, or you know, if we're trying to study them, we'd like them to be exerting reasonable forces. Uh, there's other ways to do that by putting particles, embedded particle tracking it's called. So put a gel with a lot of little beads in it that you can track. But it's the same thing, you're tracking a fiducial, and then from that, by knowing the mechanical properties, you extract out a force map of the generation of forces. And they look either like this, these little vectors, um, or this heat map. But this is, unlike the sensor I just showed you, which is three dimensions but one force vector, this is lots of force vectors, but only in plane. So I'm only getting a traction force map of any XY plane. Question? Yeah. Excellent, excellent question. So I'll talk a little bit about that more, um, but the quick answer is yes, we do have an idea and actually some beautiful work that uh, uh, Paul Jamney's lab at, at University of Pennsylvania was, I just saw him talking about this last week, showing that cells actually try very hard to match the stiffness of the environment. So they, and he, I, I, don't, I didn't have time to add in this image from their very recent paper that came out a couple of months ago. But what they showed is that if you put uh, heart cells on different stiffness substrates, which could be done either through those different lengths, different stiffnesses of posts, or just by putting different, um, like these gels. When I say gel, I mean, I really mean like jello, right? And you can make jello stiffer or less stiff, right, by adding more water or you know, changing your, your recipe. So same thing with these gels that we put cells on in culture. I can make them really, really soft so that if I touched it, it would actually almost be watery, you know, that before Jello sets up. Or it could be as hard as Jello, or it could be as hard as bathroom caulk. And that would be the range of stiffness that really were, is of interest. That, that covers the range of stiffness in us uh, for muscles, or at least for the things we're interested in. If you put cells on the wrong stiffness, their cytoskeleton go, looks crazy. They don't look good. But what he showed is that if you match a heart muscle cell to the substrate, similar to heart tissue, it maintains the right shape. It looks happy, it beats well. So uh, it, it, it's sort of interesting that this phenomenon is preserved across cells and, and uh, tissue types. So matched to their appropriate environment. So what is that author? Uh, so that's for, uh, so multiple authors now. The first author is Chopra. Chopra. Yeah, C-H-O-P-R-A, -C 2011. Yep. Uh, I can give you the full reference after if you want. There's, this has actually become very popular as well, so to study the effect of these different proteins on the surface, these receptors that are mechanically sensitive, uh, why not just grab them, like you know, we saw that, that approach from Van Vliet's lab where we put it on the end of a cantilever. Here we can put a bunch of beads down that have the protein and then take a magnet, right? These are magnetic beads, take a magnetic field and I can pull on a bunch of them. I can twist them, I can yank them, and then watch the response. It's a bit like a you know, cell etch-a-sketch, if you will, right? I can see what the... Uh, or no, what's magnadoodle, I guess, right? <laughs> um, and then from there, I can watch how do the cells remodel their exosomal matrix in response to these tugging or, or pushing. Uh, so whole cell type of response, and actually there's a postdoc in my lab who did this for, uh, during his PhD. He was looking at the effect of different disease states and different protein functions that make the nucleus much stiffer. Uh, but this, this would be of interest in disease states where this whole stiffness of this individual spherical cell floating in liquid is actually changed. And I'll give you an example. Uh, malaria is one of the more prominent examples where this type of test is very powerful, uh, so, you know, or even sickle cell anemia. So essentially, the this, this stiffness, how well this thing gets, they're just taking a straw, right, with a very calibrated pressure source and sucking the, the cell up and seeing how hard do you have to suck on the straw to, get, to go in. In malaria, the cell is actually gets stiffer and stiffer with disease state. Um, and in fact, there's a, a lab at MIT that did a lot of work with uh, so, uh, uh, hematology group, I think, at the Curie Institute, that found that essentially there, there's sort of two types of malaria. There's a malaria that will make you very sick and will be very painful, but you will survive, and there's a malaria that will clog up all of your bodily organs and kill you if you are not treated um, within a, a fairly short term of time. 
And it turns out to be a mechanical, you know, that, that cause of death is very mechanical. It's because cells can no longer fit through capillaries, can no longer fit through the different pores in the kidney and other, other places where they normally are able to. And so this deformability assay is, was a very quick way that they started trying to disseminate um, quick tests in the field for doctors to be able to tell what is the need, you know, if we have a thousand sick patients and we only have enough of this very expensive, very scarce drug, how do we know which of the 1% of these people are going to die if they don't get this drug and the other people will recover? And this was a very quick way. What, I'm sorry, one and then two. <laughs> It, so this, this particular virus um, actually change, hijacks the cell machinery and changes the, the membrane and reinforces the cytoskeleton in a way that makes the cell stiffer. But I don't think they actually get bigger because otherwise that would be an easy way to tell, right? Look at the, one, look at the people who have bigger cells. And there was another question. Yes, practically, how, how did they do this So there's, uh, there's different ways people are trying to do that. Uh, liquid will naturally flow by what's called capillary forces. Um, so, you know, uh, thinking about paper towel, right? So it picks up water off your counter through the fact that it, it's absorbent, right? So it, it, it has little pores in it that the water wants to flow up into those capillaries. Uh, so essentially they, they could use, put a droplet of blood in and the capillary force would want to pull the, the fluid through, but in the fluid that had cells that could not squeeze through, it would clog up sooner, essentially. And, I, and I'm not sure those are, those are in development. I'm not sure they're, they're kind of distributed as a, a final function yet, but that was um, Super Suresh Lab from MIT. He's actually now the director of the National Science Foundation, so I think he's a very much an engineer from mechanical and, and materials background, and he came to all these biological applications as well, so he's sort of a role model for someone like me, so it's nice to see National Science Foundation being led by the right kind of people. <laughs> um, Okay, so I talked about this one already, right? It's atomic force microscopy and these surface receptors. And this, this is, you know, both, the, again, being able to query mechanically the, the strength of binding between different types or just to see what is the density. Um, another method people use is called an optical trap. So I can focus a laser onto these little beads, use surface coating of proteins, again, that make it stick to the surface of the cell. And then by taking the laser and the light pressure of the laser, I can pull on the cell. It's, it's effectively the same thing as sucking it through a straw, except I'm doing it by pulling it on two ends. Very small forces available with this type of technique, though. Um, and then actually, I forgot I had a slide. So this is from Super, uh, Super's paper on how the cell, how the cell type changes from uh, what is the deformability in unaffected to one that's un in a fully uh, infected. And it's kind of interesting, he shows some great videos. You know, you start to see even sort of the murkiness inside the cell as the virus is hijacking and really kind of densifying that internal structure of the cells. And it's getting stiffer and these optical traps just cannot, cannot exert enough force to deform this anymore, even at, you know, a whopping 150 piconewtons. But again, you know, cell deformability of blood cells, look how much they deform under 150 piconewtons. So then it's not surprising that a you know, a few piconewtons can unfold an individual protein if this is a blood cell under tens of piconewtons. Uh, over some time they would. So they have a, they have a, uh, they're not, a, they're not like elastic, perfectly like a slinky. There's, you know, there's fluid in there, so kind of, and there's, there's what's called a viscoelastic response to these. So thinking about silly putty, you know, I can pull it very slowly or pull it very fast, and it behaves very differently. So cells do tend to restore back to their original form. Time constants probably on the order of seconds. Excuse me. Yeah. So in, in that last slide, there is just that one particular stage that they cannot deform the cell. All the others. So it would be really useful for. I don't remember the the, the definitions. This is in my field for the trophozoite versus the schizont, but I believe that this would be your terminal stage. Yes, yeah, so once you've got to a point where this cell, so at this point, these cells are still gonna squeeze through your capillaries and your organs. Like that, so think about, it was actually another good scale, right? Um, this blood, red blood cell, seven microns, capillaries, two microns. We are all sitting here with millions and millions of blood cells squeezing through two micron holes, something three times smaller than them. They are doing this on a regular, like all of our blood cells are doing this on every trip through through the body, and Dan probably knows the number of how many gallons of blood or how many red blood cells per, but I don't know, but millions, certainly millions, um, are doing this, right? This is, this is our normal behavior of our blood cells. 
So this is, this is where it will kill you. Um, and so it, it picks it up at the important stage, I would say. <laughs> and then uh, someone asked the question about cells responding to um, stiffness. This was a kind of indirect way of getting that. So cell area, cell spreading as well. So this was kind of, they took these, those pillars that I showed you and they put protein so that the cell would preferentially be able to spread to either only very small areas or larger areas. And they also showed that cell fate uh, was proportional to the, the size of the cell area. So they could, if they stretched out a cell too much or made it too small, apoptosis means cell death. So they could force cells to die by either forcing them to spread out too much beyond what they wanted to or constraining them to too small. So there is also a size uh, mediation. And then using these uh, force post sensors again, how would these be made? Not so different from the ink stamp that I showed you before for patterning proteins on the surface. So I make a mold and then I make it out of this silicone, you know, expensive silicone bathroom cock, peel it off. Uh, I, the reason I do this double mold process is, you know, I, I tend to lose less of the little fingers if I'm peeling it out of a soft mold. That's the only reason that they do this. So they end up with all these little pillars standing up and again they get these traction forces. But there's been other interesting ways of, you know, trying to use really cool um, optical diffraction so you can get uh, much better, quicker mapping, say, of the uh, microprost arrays. And then we've got a um, whole bunch So kind of now, what have people used for myocytes? So we're, you know, we want to talk about cardiovascular after all. So folks have tried to figure out force displacement or mechanical properties of myocytes by, this one's pretty cool, but um, you can imagine pretty tedious. They're literally picking up with this little, you know, and by manipulating with these little probes, so grad student operated, right, and I know the woman who did this. Um, this is very painstaking, every few days one of these experiments might work on one heart cell and try to stretch the heart cell, I mean, just like you with a, what's called a tensile test or the way mechanical properties are tested in, in everyday materials. This is actually done, I don't know, but regularly, there are some experts in the world and I think you and Ashley is talking later this quarter as well, so he uses this technique which is to take these very fine carbon fibers. Remember, the cell is on the order of about 100 microns, so now you see these fibers about 10 microns. Uh, put, taking these sort of 10 micron carbon fibers, almost like two little hairs, right, and sticking it down onto the cell, picking up the cell so it's stuck there, and then I'm watching those fibers do this. So even though I'm not going to talk an awful lot about MEMS cantilevers, most of the analysis we do in the end is just analyzing these cantilever structures, right, little diving board force displacement type thing, so carbon fibers, this thing, you know, again, is, is deflection like this, the micro posts that we saw before, and this, was, this would be some of the few examples, these little embedded particles underneath a cell. Uh, here's a, exactly a cantilever, so a lot of groups have been putting uh, heart cells directly onto a little deformable cantilever and then watching how much the cantilever bends, using that to try to say how much work can the heart cell do. So lots of ways folks have, have tried to do this. Um, Here's that, that kind of grab the heart cell. And what you can see is that, you know, the way that they are doing this is they can actually image, remember that subcellular structure of, of the heart cells that we want to preserve, and I'll talk a bit more about that. And then image it while I'm stretching it. Uh, and look at the change in, in the spacing. So you see those little lines there I want to talk about a little bit more. And then on a population level, so we're kind of stepping through these types of techniques as, you know, protein, single cells, and. Um, other techniques, so deformable substrates. So basically just culture the cells directly on an elastic rubber, if you will, stretch it, if that's what you want you know, to, to measure the stiffness or to, uh, to stimulate them, uh, and then see what happens. Or the other way to do it would just be to put the cells into a little flow cell, flow liquid over it, like our blood, our blood vessels are constantly subjecting cells in our lining our blood vessel to what's called shear flow. So fluid is going over them, and those cells are seeing that kind of loading. So if we want to to understand in a dish how they respond, then we have to engineer little systems that, that can apply calibrated um, flow cells. So those are uh, the wide world of force measurements, right? And, and now I want to talk just a little bit before we take a break about some of the biomaterials issues with these different devices. So how do we choose different biomaterials? And actually, it's kind of, there's whole books on biomaterials. Um, but the definition of a biomaterial would be anything you're going to put in contact with biology. Right? And then depending on what biology or what organ you're going to put the, the material in contact with, your definition of whether something is, quote, biocompatible 
uh, really is context dependent, right? And I think it's really interesting that um, you know, there, there's mention of the Spitfire pilot. So 1949, we accidentally, scientists accidentally found out windshields shattered and uh, veterans, pilots with embedded polyacrylamide in their eyes had no ill effects, no inflammatory response. So in the context of the eye, this was then determined to be a biocompatible material. And we use it all the time now in things like contact lenses, right? And then the biocompatibility of contact lenses, of course, for long-term wearing, you remember when they used to be, had to take them out after so many hours, and now you can wear and sleep in them. So people figured out that respiration was important to the eye. So you know, in terms of biocompatibility, there's time scales, and there's context. Uh, in terms of, and again, at the same time, we had you know, pioneers inventing things like hip implants. And you, I think you really had to be in a lot of pain to um, opt for a hip implant in the 50s. You probably had, you were probably in a wheelchair and had no option. Uh, it, it was a very, this was a very experimental. And the things that we learned it over the um, intervening decades are, are amazing in terms of not just the biomaterial, but the body's response to the biomaterial. And people found out things like if you made the hip implant, so if you're thinking about the design constraints of a hip implant, I don't want the hip implant to break. So the first school of thought was make the hip implant stronger than the original hip, and then we'll have no problem. But what happened is that I made the hip implant so strong that all the surrounding bone didn't have to do any work. I'm like a bone in space now. So the body just resorbed the bone, and then the hip implant falls out because there wasn't enough loading on the surrounding bones. So again, this uh, mechanobiology became discovered at that time. And, and you know, we can sort of tell similar stories for things about vascular grafts and the like. But if we look at the list of things that where you know, biomaterials or biocompatibility would be um, important, you know, we really see it in pretty much in, in every, almost every system where we might want to in, insert a material for some different use. Uh, I don't know, I won't take a poll of how many people have any of these, but you probably know someone who has some, some biomaterials uh, serving one of these purposes. So whether it's you know, knee joints or dentures or crowns. So I have a question. Yeah. So now we keep reading in the newspaper about these metal to metal uh, joints and all the issues with the little parts flipping off and all that. Mm -hmm. Um, <laughs> you know, it's, it's kind of interesting. It is almost impossible, as you'll come away with a sort of either, you know, dismay or hope or optimism about the state of the field, but it is, it is really hard to recreate the in vivo environment, as it's called, so to replicate what's in the body. So for these manufacturers who are designing things like, whether it's, you know, a crown for your tooth or hip implants, it's really impossible to, for them to replicate exactly the type of test protocol. So the FDA, uh, so to go through approvals for these things, the FDA has mandated different types of tests uh, that would satisfy, and I, would, I, I think it's still true if you talk to some of my colleagues about expected longevity of a hip implant today, uh, best case is still 20 years for most orthopedic, hip, or most orthopedic implants, period. Uh, and I mean, full disclosure, I should say my sister's a professor at Berkeley and has been studying this for 20 years. So she works with orthopedic surgeons. She gets the recovered hip implants um, and looks at the tribology, it's called, the wear. So exactly what you said, that kind of fretting of the surfaces. And there are, there are design features about, in fact, metal on metal is kind of not so common anymore. So there are typically some other kind of lubricating surface and metal on the other side. But the, the reality is that, um, you know, Material, materials wear down, right? So there is, and the, the question is, how does the body respond? And the inflammatory response that you're referring to is actually those particles set up again inflammation, recruit white blood cells, macrophages, which engulf the, the foreign body, the matter, um, and then sort of create almost detritus in, in the area. Uh, so in terms of, you know, how, how do we start to design around that, people are definitely looking at that. Um, and the ones that are being recovered now have probably been in service, they've probably been in, implanted for 10 or 15 years. Whereas when you're talking about people 20 years ago having a hip implant, they were saying the expected lifetime of that would be five to 10 years, and then you'd need what's called a revision. So I'd say the, the hope is getting better. 
for the, the duration which they'll last. But Yeah, and there's there are definitely it's a whole. I think there's like three semesters worth of courses on uh, orthopedic implant design, that which I'm not qualified to give that lecture. Not even one of them. Um, but <laughs> but there are a lot of design issues here. I think the hardest one though is this is exemplified by, for instance, the idea of that what's called stress shielding that I talked about before, right? Which was if you make it too strong and you take the load off the bone, then the, that was a ver that was a surprise. So people only worried about again. Remember I said there's biomechanics, right? Measuring kind of the mechanical properties and then treat it as stuff. And then there's mechanobiology, which is what does the biology think of all that? And how is it gonna remodel? And so that what's called stress shielding, where I shielded that bone from carrying any load, um, it led to the early failure of those hip implants. And so there's, um, I don't know who has the quote about, you know, there's the, the known knowns, you know, the unknowns, and the thing that gets you is the unknown unknowns. And, and I'd say that's very much true in the, in, in the, the biomedical design area. So how do you start to, to guess that? Well, the best we can do is to look at some of the requirements, not the best we can do, but one thing we can do is to look at the requirements that the FDA has mandated. So if you're going through clinical trials, you want to bring an even plant to, um, to market, which is also like a five-year process, um, it, unless you change nothing about the exterior of that and what the body's going to think of the exterior, even a pacemaker, right? So if you're going to design, redesign the surface of a, of a pacemaker, you want to, if you want to redesign electronics, you might be able to get a sort of revision to your existing uh, clinical trial approval. But if you want to redesign the electrode or the thing that the, that the body's going to have some say in what it thinks about it, because this is the response that can happen, you know, in terms of how the body deals with a, a foreign body, it's called, this reaction, it, you know, for most, most biomaterials, the best you can hope for is the body walls it off and ignores it. And I would say that this is also one of the best examples of why at least until recently, um, it's been nearly impossible to have an implanted pressure sensor. So we talked about all the places pressure sensors are, and they're used in surgery for catheters. But if you do this to a pressure sensor, you're no longer measuring blood pressure, right? Uh, so depending on the thing that you're, you're talking about, or if you do this to a pacemaker electrode, then you're no longer delivering the voltage um, to the heart tissue that you, you hoped. <laughs> So what, what's responsible for this? All kinds of cell types. It's a whole army of them uh, that gets drafted, recruited in response to this chemical response called uh, you know, those cytokines, the protein response. So that kind of, that signal goes out through your lymph system, goes out through your circulatory system. And then there are cell types that follow that gradient. So they just keep, they can go in and out of our blood vessels, in and out of our lymph system, and they can home in to sites of inflammation. Uh, and so the first ones to get there are these things called the neutrophils. And then you notice somewhere in here, uh, this is the one I just want you to uh, keep in mind because when we talk about sort of a heart attack, the fibroblast, remember, most populous cell in the heart. These are the guys that come and do that walling off and do the scar tissue formation. Or, you know, in healthy tissue, they're the ones that build up the extracellular matrix and maintain it. Um, so the fibroblasts come and on some time scale after they arrive, right? So. I don't know if it's the cavalry is here or not, but they're here to, you know, it's more like the, the civil engineering corps is here, right? We're here to build, we're gonna build up what's called, they say fibrosis, scar tissue, right? So, and, and an infarct or heart attack region uh, ultimately is, is that scar tissue area. Question? Yep. What was this giant cell? Oh. Oh, yeah, so that's actually, it, it, giant foam cells are actually mononucleated uh, macrophages joined together and they become termed a giant cell because they, they cooperate. So it ends up being a mono, multinucleated uh, cell that, that can communicate and do this, right? And figure out where are the boundaries of the, uh, the foreign body and engulf it. Let me just cover that. Okay. So just kind of a graphical picture from another, you know, uh, two and hours, nice review on this. But kind of all the things that, you know, so how do we avoid? Uh, having the implant be rejected by the body. So we have to worry about you know, things like biofouling, stuff that shouldn't be on the surface, whether it's shed particles or not. Um, if we want to image a surface, then I, I need to figure out ways to interact with that, whether it's optically or chemically imaging the surface. Uh, 
and worrying about, you know, so there's ways around this that I'll talk about. So people have figured out by changing the topography of the surface, you can change how cells think about them, how they see them. So that's pretty cool. Uh, just a few images, give you an idea of, of certain MEMS materials. Oops, yeah, I think it's the same thing. So here's an example. This is, that, again, that foreign body giant cell, it's called, where a bunch of cells have come together and just walled off an electrode, um, and then looking at the response over time of, of biocompatibility or biofouling of different materials. This is one of my favorites, this paper, um, is because it's so comical in how bad microfabricated materials are on their own to be put into contact with the blood. So again, the idea of different systems, different biocompatibility tests. So the same material that might be just fine, you know, uh, as a corneal implant, put it into the blood system, one of the toughest areas to, to have a biomaterial in the cardiovascular system. This is what's called a hemocompatibility test. So put the material in contact with blood and see how long it takes for clotting to occur on the surface. All of the materials had so many cells they couldn't count them after five minutes. So all of the images in this paper are taken at five minute intervals. That's, to my mind, I, there's no material I want in my cardiovascular system if the clotting time is five minutes. Uh, so we don't really have good hemocompatibility on any, any implanted material. Uh, the way that we get that is to surface treat it. So I'll talk about that, which is basically to deter binding, so chemically treat it. Uh, these, there's also kind of, uh, art, you know, we talk, I talked a lot about artificial biomaterials. I want to point out this is, this is a, you know, an actual tissue. So there, there are, I don't know how many of these surgeries are done every year, but if you have a leaky heart valve, one option, you can either get the all mechanical biomaterial or you can get a porcine or a pig. Right? And so this has obviously been irradiated. The tissue isn't living anymore, but the tissue is still there mechanically. Um, and this is what can happen, so this, you know, calcification of, you know, quote, the, the real tissue, so we can still get that kind of response. And so this is where you're supposed to be pumping blood right, through these valves. Um, as that starts to calcify, that's a, a problem. So there's, there's not just, you know, we have to think about the cells, think about the material we're going to use, and if we want to try to use um, biomaterials, so these individual or artificial scaffolds, uh, which I'll talk a bit more about, I have a lot of colleagues who are designing biomaterials to be kind of almost like sponge-like host, right? So develop an artificial tissue where we have this scaffold to carry the cells and then implant that. And so this is kind of a dire one direction that people are thinking of. The other direction is just cells alone. So some of you may have heard of some clinical trials, I think, all in other countries, uh, if I'm not mistaken, of injecting things like stem cells and ho have, hoping to have them go to the right place. Um, most of the talks I've seen about that say that, you know, if you, if you wait six months, none of them are in the place that you, that you thought they should be. So cells alone has been a concern, which is why people are trying to kind of create a home, if you will, right? So pitch the tent uh, for the cells to populate and then see if you can create an environment where they'll integrate into that. So our goal then, I think we'll we should take a break um, here, but basically the goal of where we want to get with these artificial materials, understanding cell mechanobiology and, and the like, is that you know, in a heart attack, we generate this area of death. You know, there's no blood flow, no blood vessels to it. If we want to go and engineer a, a patch or, or restore function to that area, there's a lot we have to think about. We have to put cells that function. We need to give them a background, right? get rid of the scar tissue somehow. So put them back into a healthy um, tissue. And also, if we can regenerate, get the, you know, so the body has an amazing capability to create new blood vessels. But we need, basically, we need to give that damaged tissue the ability to make the cues that recruit new blood vessels to grow into that area. So if there's dead tissue and it's a scar, then it, it's avascular at that point. So we want to restore that, that area. So if we want to pursue things like the regenerative therapies, and so I'm probably encroaching a little bit in the next section about uh, what, what Joe is going to talk about next time, but uh, I would say that Joe is probably going to be focusing an awful lot on you know, the broader potential, the differentiation potential, and the biochemical factors. And I want to talk about some of the other things we can do to guide these type of cells, like the ones that are on my cover slide, uh, which is this doesn't look like it's going to help your heart. They don't look like heart cells. How can we get them there? So how can we help mature those cells into something that can do work and actually add function back into uh, an ailing heart? So why don't we take a, a few minute break here? One quick question. What's the total power of a heart? Ooh. 
Uh, never thought about it in terms of power. One human power. <laughs> there you go. I guess we could do some math on a pressure volume loop, right? But there are millimeters of mercury and liters of blood. Um, <laughs> Easily calculated. Yeah. We don't think the, about it yeah, the numbers that I, I mean, so Dan probably knows these numbers better than I do, but just thinking about sort of blood pressure, you know, sort of 100, you know, 100 millimeters of mercury, and then talking about, you know, so many liters of blood, 20 or so liters of blood circulating the body. No, four and a half liters per minute. Per minute, okay, but total volume, and then four and a half per minute, okay. Yeah. So we could we could sort of do some some pressure volume, but it, the units would be weird, so I'd, I'd have to stop and look up some conversion factors for you. <laughs> All right, why don't we take a break here? So two, two questions that someone just asked that uh, are very important to the second half of the talk. So for orientation, this is the heart. Doesn't quite look like the Valentine's Day card, uh, but we have four chambers, hopefully, uh, two ventricle, two atrial chambers. And the left ventricle is the one that's, that's doing the work to pump the blood through your body. The right ventricle is pumping it, uh, doing the work to pump it through your lungs and reoxygenate it. Uh, arteries are receiving. So if we zoom in on the wall of the left ventricle, say we zoom in here and look at this layered structure, and each of these little brick-like things in, a, in the ventricle, not all myocytes look like this, is a heart cell or a myocyte. And these are the sort of the motor units of, of the heart that are doing the work. So we've got this kind of muscle cell, muscle um, section in the middle of the heart. And then actually it's worth pointing out that on the very inside of the heart here, it's kind of hard to read, but it's something called the endothelium. So our entire cardiovascular system is lined with these special cell types called endothelial cells. And their job is to sort of minimize or prevent clotting, uh, provide a nice smooth lubricated surface, if you will, and to maintain an impermeability to things like plaques that could cause atherosclerosis. So a healthy endothelium or uh, you know, sort of this lining is very important. And, and I'll talk about that as we talk about arteries a bit more. But the actual heart structure on the inside wall of it would be lined with the endothelium. The sort of business part of it here um, in the myocardium would be these myocytes. And then if we kind of zoom in um, on the individual heart cells, essentially they're muscle fibers. But the, the unit doing the work in muscle you may have heard of is uh, actomyosin contraction. So there's actin filaments and these little myosin motor heads that walk along actomyosin. So all muscle contraction all trafficking, of, not all trafficking, but a lot of trafficking of, of small structures in the body is done by these myosin little motor proteins, they're called. We have other types of motor proteins, but the, the key work units are the interaction of this actin myosin filaments. And then from here to here, so these little yellow lines, when we were looking at that image of the myocyte, we saw those lines going along. Those are the Z disks or the, the sarcomeres. So these are all lined up. And in between these sarcomeres, we've got these work units of the actin myosin contraction that are pulling them closer together and then relaxing. And so and the myosin you know, walks along. It's a two headed type of protein. So it's actually kind of doing this along the actin fibers. So it's swinging kind of leg to leg, one, one leg in, in contact all the time. Um, and someone asked the question, and this is I'm not a biochemist, uh, but Essentially, life runs on something called ATP, um, and so it's this phosphorylation or dephosphorylation, so conversion between ADP and ATP. So with all the food we eat gets converted into the amino acids that the body needs to make the fuel, right, to, to rebuild all the other proteins and, and run them. Yeah. What is it about heart muscle that allows it to seamlessly operate as opposed to what other muscles that become fatigued? Uh, well, so not all muscle does become fatigued. So, and again, this is not my area of expertise, but in, even in skeletal muscle, you have um, slow and fast types of muscle. So uh, it, it, it's the fast ones that become fatigued. So kind of, and in sprinters, right? Uh, if you think about the Olympic sprinters have built up these large muscles, large uh, quads, and they've built up an awful lot of their fast twitch muscle mass. But they develop yeah, but, but then think about like a marathon runner. They develop more of the slow twitch, uh, slow twitch muscle. So it's possible to develop both, you know, the, depending on the type of sport or training that you do. Um, and and it, it's worth actually note, uh, commenting, and this is actually Dan's area of expertise, you've probably heard about this already, but when your body is responding to, whether it's exercise or, or overload um, or some other challenges, from sort of the, the down, you know, this is trying to, one left ventricle is pumping the volume into the rest of our systemic 
cardiovascular system, the resistance of our plumbing, if you will. So if it has to work harder against that, then what does the heart have, you know, it can either continue to kind of uh, increase your heart rate in order to pump the same volume more rapidly, or eventually it can increase its volume or try to increase its work. And so over time, one way of adapting, much like we talked about bone can remodel over time and heal on even eight week time scale, thinking about a broken bone, heart muscle also can not remodel in the same way. So it, we don't make, we don't efficiently make new myocytes, new heart cells. So when the, the heart wall wants to beef up, those individual myocytes grow in size. And that's, that's called hypertrophy. Probably grossly oversimplified that, but. <laughs> uh, and then looking downstream, so a little cross section of, you know, part of the plumbing, thinking about an artery, I want to point out again, the whole thing is lined with this endothelium. So this is, you know, again, reducing permeability to plaques, keep this healthy. These guys actually are great mechanical sensors. So the endothelial cells actually respond to the shear flow. They respond to the changes in blood flow. And they send out then chemical factors that talk to this intervening uh, medial layer, which is the smooth muscle cell. So there's actually muscle in our arteries. You know, it's not usually muscle we think about building up, but uh, you know, through exercise, of course, you actually are increasing the demand for blood in your body. And you'll notice that you know, when you first start walking, you're like, whoa, I feel a bit out of breath, but then you kind of acclimate. But right when you first walk up a flight of stairs, there is this kind of shortness of breath or you're, you, you're noticeable working harder. And then with training or if you keep you know, working and walking, uh, your body develops a better ability to dilate or to better respond, right, to both your heart and your blood vessels. But essentially, this can change the downstream resistance for the heart. So the ability of these muscle cells to dilate the vessels and allow more flow through, um, or conversely, to constrict. And so, you know, various, various uh, diseases that, that can result from that. So kind of giving, you know, the, the zoom in again, right, starting from the scale, so 25 centimeters there, looking at um, sort of the, the aorta, right, and sort of large blood vessels. And then zooming in on the, almost looks like lasagna, like the layers of, of the artery and how it's kind of held together. So it's a very springy material. And if we keep zooming in, you know, again, we've got sort of the inside endothelial lining, the medial outside of it in a blood vessel. And the way that they're layered allows them to do, do a lot of um, useful work in contracting the di diameter of the blood vessels, so to dilate them as well. So it's both mechanically and chemically activated. And so the individual, as I zoom in on individual capillary, even down to those two micron capillaries, we're talking about just sort of maybe even a single endothelial cells creating that what's called lumen, creating the pipe. So, you know, we want to have this kind of surface and we'd like to be able to restore that surface whether we're talking about a stent um, or we're talking about any kind of heart implant. So that when I put in a sort of shiny new metal or other material of stent, I don't have an endothelial layer anymore. And so often folks have to take something called blood thinners, right, which will keep that clotting at bay because these guys actually are much more effective um, at reducing clots. So we want to have a healthy endothelium. So there is a lot of interest in companies like Abbott Vascular or Medtronic in finding ways to have the stents encourage ingrowth of those cells, right, so to make them at home. Um, and then, of course, I, I also, you know, don't want to forget most popular cell in the body, fibroblast, um, and it can create all kinds of other cells. There is, in the last few years, actually, um, some evidence for direct differentiation, direct reprogramming of fibroblasts into cardiac myocytes. So this is a, an area of slowly increasing interest for folks, because if you could take this most popular cell type in the heart and convince it to more efficiently convert into myocytes, then we wouldn't even have to go through the process of making induced pluripotent stem cells. Potentially, we could come up with a, a therapy, whether it's a small molecule or a drug therapy, or maybe it's a mechanical intervention that we actually encourage the fibroblast to now repopulate that infarct, right, that scar region. So that's something that is of interest. And then here are just some, uh, some images of this, what's, you know, that remodeling, as it's called. So that adaptation that we see of the tissues, whether it's in blood vessels or in the heart, but looking at you know, increasingly thickened um, myocardium in response to that overload. And again, remember the number of cells hasn't changed, so that means the size of the individual cells has increased 
you know, two, threefold potentially in the cross-sectional area. And if you remember the work unit being those kind of sarcomere lines, if I increase the diameter of any one of those heart cells, I sort of increase the number of actin myosin filaments, right, that might be available to, to bring those, those units together. So that's kind of one way that they, they do that. And so this kind of led to some questions um, that we were interested in exploring with Dan, which is, is this idea of how the cardiovascular system is loaded and remodels at the heart and tissue and muscle level, is that actually something that is driven almost at a, you know, if, where is it driven by? So is it driven by those, fi those fibroblasts and those popular, or not popular, popular? Populated <laughs> cells in the heart, um, but the ones that kind of make up the ECM, right, the extracellular matrix that I talked about? Or is it really being driven by the individual heart cells themselves? Or, you know, is it is a combination? And it's probably, you know, the answer in biology is always complicated, and it probably is a combination, but maybe a better question is what role are the individual heart cells playing? So thinking about how do we start to uh, recapitulate <laughs> what cells in the ventricle are seeing in a dish, sort of the, the point here. So if we can kind of recapitulate the loading that they see uh, there. And again, sort of this idea of resistance to contraction for vessel, or not blood vessels, but uh, uh, cells that are in the ventricle, can we recapitulate the loading that they would see? So if you think about it, that's actually, it's something that we, we would think about the heart is never fully at rest. Right? So we always have a base blood pressure. There's always some stretch. There's always this preload, and there's always this um, afterload, which is that downstream resistance of our cardiovascular system. So I'm always kind of got an inflated or stretched out heart muscle, and then I'm doing work against a downstream load. So we want to be able to balance um, those. And simple models would be like a balloon, right? which basically says that I increase the pressure. So the ventricle is just a, a pressure vessel, so it's a balloon. As I increase the pressure, I increase the tension in the wall. And so thinking about uh, high blood pressure being effectively the same as stretching the wall to some degree. So that would be one surrogate for how we would think about this in, in culture. So again, I, I, just to reiterate the, you know, this idea of, of mechanics, so we can worry about how stiff, how hard is it to pull on a myocyte, and we, we would like to understand their mechanical properties because that gives us an, some idea of how to match um, heart cells in their environment. And we'd also like to understand how they sense their mechanical environment and react to the mechanical environment in terms of differentiation, this remodeling into a hypertrophic state, or can we, can we uh, convince cells to, be, you know, to go back to a healthy state? And then there's actually a, another sort of open question, which is that even in um, culture of mammalian models, say rat or mice or dogs, if you were to isolate heart tissue and try to put them in culture, so what's called primary, so the cells have been taken directly from an animal, a primary source, and we're watching them in culture, they don't survive very long. So we hear about cell culture and, and having cells renew themselves you know, for tens or hundreds of cell divisions and passages. This is true for stem cells. This is true for fibroblasts. One of the cell types that you cannot keep in culture as a, a cell line, as it's called, is a heart cell. So a lot of the work has been done with primary, which means that an animal had to sacrifice the cells to do the test. And yet the test has to be done within hours or certainly, depending on the test, days of isolation. And so this is a very costly uh, method of investigation. So if we could come up with ways to make these cells more viable for longer, we'd also, you know, we could come up with platforms where we could do drug testing on heart cells on a dish. So could we find out that a, a particular drug interferes with cardiac signaling in a dish before we do a clinical trial, or before we even do an animal trial? So if we can come up with, with ways to do that. And that should say CMs, not CMs, cardiac myocytes. So just for space convenience, uh, start to abbreviate cardiac myocytes or heart cells as CMs. So these are some of the questions that we've been interested in uh, in conjunction with Dan's lab, and in particular, you know, in, in thinking about animal models, right? So when, where we, if we've got a, an injury or damage that's been induced, and can we detect these kinds of differences? So someone asked about the power or the amount of work a, a heart can do, and often we think about these things in terms of a volume. So it, it's a lot like for me as a mechanical engineer, a force versus displacement. So volume and pressure curve. And the idea of, of this behavior that was observed decades ago, was it in the 40s by Frank and Sterling, uh, is that if I 
increase, and this is the, the beauty, right, of the, I go up the flight of stairs, this, you know, we have amazing machines. The beauty of the heart muscle is that to a point, the harder I ask it to work, the harder it can work, right? So the individual myocyte unit is believed is actually able to tailor the amount of force that it generates in response to that stretch. So here it's in terms of pressure, but remember from that diagram I showed you, sort of the, the model of a balloon, as I increase the pressure in the balloon, I increase the stretch in the membrane or the wall of the heart. And so this is equivalent to saying that if I stretch or preload the heart cell, it should actually pull back with more force. And that's essentially what happens in the, in the heart muscle. So where does that lead us as engineers? Uh, we've been interested on a, on a lot of fronts with our collaborators of ways in addition to, so I will not discount the biochemical differentiation, um, and Joe Wu will talk about a lot of those, those breakthroughs next week, but in conjunction with that, we'd like to find ways, because the biochemical differentiation to get to a heart cell from a stem cell or a pluripotent cell takes literally weeks, right? maybe even months from sort of the, the time you conceive of wanting to build a patch, if you will, and that's a long time to wait. For reference, when a person has a heart attack, the amount of time that it takes to go to that stable scar tissue state is also on the order of weeks or months. So you actually have a few day window before the heart has started to form the scar tissue. Remember that timeline I showed you of when the different cells come in and do their work? So days to weeks. So if we could come up with a therapy where we could um, induce the heart to heal itself more efficiently by whatever means, biochemical, mechanical, electrical, um, a scaffold, artificial scaffold, to reinforce that and allow healing to take place instead of fibrosis or scarring, then we could really do a lot of good on regenerative therapies. And it may not mean taking your cells and transforming them into heart cells and putting them back. It may just mean juicing up or you know, increasing the efficiency of cell types that are already in our bodies and encouraging them to, to heal correctly, to, to go back in the right place. So these are, uh, there's a lot of papers that are documenting the effect of these different parameters on the health in particular of stem cells and myocytes or myocytes derived from stem cells. So I want to go through um, kind of from our perspective, just to give you an idea of the timeline. When we look at those stem cells that don't look like much, and actually those, those beating cells that I told you, they were not here. They were already out here uh, somewhere in, in like a month after the experiment was started. So by the time we're able to take that video of beating cells in a dish, it is already a month after the stem cells had been sort of you know, started down this process. And then we want to grow enough of them. So first you have to expand the number of cells through cell division, encourage them to become myocytes, grow enough of them that we can put them into, in this case they were little tissue strips, and populate this biomaterial with cardiac myocytes. And we have this beating you know, tissue strip. It doesn't look very good. The, the cells don't look like healthy myocytes. They look like those blobs I showed you before. But then you know, we start with sort of almost you know, baby steps, if you will, right? We have to see what does the body do? And Joe will probably talk about this next week, but a stem cell is scary in the sense that it looks an awful lot like a cancer cell, right? It has the power to grow boundlessly. It, it just doesn't have the programming, and it has the power to become many other things and to go where it wants. And so we want to make sure, for starters, if we're going to do something with stem cells or regenerative therapy, that we don't have a propensity towards uh, creating a tumor cancerous potential. So the first kind of studies that we might look at would be, uh, we want to see this kind of trend, right? Where we put in cells and there's natural cell death, right? So not all the cells are going to make it. A bad test of whether or not this biomaterial and this stem cell graft is kind of going to do more harm than good would be if, if this was the start point. And I see increasing number of cells, right? So that's going towards tumor. So we look at uh, whether or not mechanical conditioning, so we preloaded in this case, and then we implant them into a, a the leg of a mouse um, and looked over time whether or not we had sort of a tumorogenic um, timeline. And we saw with mechanical conditioning that we, were, we actually had much better outcomes, right? So very simple type of experiments. So we, the cells survived, but they didn't proliferate, um, which may sound like not what you want, but you actually kind of want, in the case of the heart, I'd like to put in a known number of cells, maybe lose a few of them, but I don't necessarily want to add more and more heart cells to the heart, right? I just want to restore just enough to restore function. So some of the assessments that our lab is particularly interested in, and I know there's a lot of terminology here, so I'll explain what these all mean, but uh, morphology, cell shape, protein localization. Does the protein go to the right place? 
Um, contractility, so the metric today for whether or not we've made a stem cell into a heart cell, we can look biochemically, does it have some of the proteins, right, are they in the right place? Morphology can look at the right shape, and then contractility means is it beating? And that's all it means. So it doesn't, it doesn't have anything to do with how much work it can do. So if I took that beating heart cell, generating a small amount of force, and put it into damaged heart tissue, does it have enough uh, ability to do work to even deform that damaged heart muscle wall? So the ability to do work would be the, to measure the force generation, the work potential, and not just is it moving. Um, and then, of course, you want to make sure that it actually plugs in, if you will. So think about snapping a Lego block into your building, right? It, we actually want it to plug and play and, and to fit in to that morphology or that brick-like pattern that we saw in the heart, which means that it needs cell cells, so those proteins that make cells talk to each other have to be in the right place. It needs to uh, talk to the rest of the myocardium, so it's, it's able to, to link in with all the stuff the fibroblasts and the neighbors have put down. And does it, is it do all this under load? So our goal has been to try to create metrics you know, at the micro scale for, for understanding that. And so we work with a lot of folks um, in the Cardiovascular Institute in particular to understand what do these types of proteins look like in cardiovascular cell types. So there's a bit of a zoom in on some of the particular proteins. Uh, as I mentioned before, calcium-dependent adhesion proteins make cells stick together. We want those to be in the right place. There is a, you know, one, one particular heart disease where you know, with sort of leaky ventricle because of a failure of the cadherins to bind appropriately to each other. So that is a defect we want to avoid. We wouldn't want to induce that defect through tissue engineering. And the ability of that, so basically if the cell contracts and it doesn't, when I pull on this rope, this actin stress fiber, it needs to have an anchor, right? Otherwise I've just, again, I've got contractility. The cell is moving, but it's not plugged in, it's not connected through its cytoskeleton to to the rest of the world. So in order for it to generate force, it has to have those attachment points, both to each other and to the, to the underlying matrix. So what does that mean for a myocyte? These are from uh, Kit Parker's lab. Really nice experiment showing the malleability of this case neonate, so newborn um, mice, I think, in this paper, uh, versus the structure of adults. So these, again, this green, is that protein that makes the cytoskeleton, right? Makes those ropes that, that kind of keep the whole tent structure all together. Alpha actinin, the red stain, is a protein that is um, involved in bundling those ropes together. So kind of keeping them all tight and tied up together. So it's also part of the giving it, giving the cell the structure that it needs. And then the blue again is the nucleus. So here we see those beautiful sarcomeres. Remember those structures where we said the actin myosin proteins are the thing doing work to pull those red lines, resting length of those on the order of two microns, and then changing maybe a half a micron with each beat is what we'd like to see. And then the question of, you know, when we put the cell in culture, do we get that two micron spacing? Or usually not, at least when we've looked, seems that it ends up a little smaller, right? Because we, we don't have that stretch, that preload. So that's something that um, we've been working with Dan's lab to try to restore that, how it looks. So again, this is what I'll call protein morphology, getting the protein to the right place and getting it looking like it should. We'd like it to look like this. We'd like the red lines to be two microns apart. Um, if you start with, a, with neonatal or the newborn heart cells, they have more growth potential. So they're much closer, if you will, to the stem cell derived myocytes in terms of growth potential. They still won't divide, they won't proliferate so much, um, but they will live longer in a dish to be studied, which is why they're a very popular model. If you read papers on uh, isolated uh, myocyte type of measurements, they're almost always done on these neonatal because they're much easier to study for several days um, in culture. The funny thing about them is that uh, they put, again, the protein patterns, and you can make them take any shape. If you want them to actually have sarcomeres in the right orientation, you have to give them this aspect ratio of about 10 to 1 in order for them to be able to do your work. Really cool paper came out recently that, as I mentioned before, I didn't have time to put it in, in the slide, but they get the same morphology and they get the same weird, you know, non-physiological shape by putting it on a substrate that's too soft or too stiff. And in the case of a uh, of a neonatal myocyte they found if they put it on a, a, a gel that was just right, which actually had the stiffness of what is known to be the stiffness of, say, muscle tissue, then it took this shape all on its own. 
You didn't even have to put down protein pattern cues. So an example where sort of a mechanical cue, 100% mechanical cue, can do the same thing as, in this case, a biochemical guidance cue. So lots of ways to, um, to start to think about that. And what do I mean by, you know, it doesn't look good when I talk about an adult myocyte. So this is some of the hurdles that, that we've been looking at. So mechanically or just even, you know, physically healthy, freshly isolated, not starting to, you know, starting to look a little bit funky, but still has most of its structure. A week later in culture, this is a, this is a dying myocyte, right? This is not a myocyte that we want to do experiments and report any findings on the effect of a drug or use that to understand function of a, of a therapy. And then even looking here, um, this is in rabbit and, and cat, this is what your healthy electrophysiology, right? So think about kind of a uh, EKG, right? You get sort of the systole, diastole, you get the, uh, that would be blood pressure. Uh, you get the P wave, S waves, right? Help me, Dan. <laughs> QRS. QRS, okay. Did you, and hopefully someone's already talked about this because I just know the characteristic shape of it. But characteristic shape is preserved at the individual myocyte level. That I know. Um, unless you keep the myocyte in culture too long. And then it starts to look all wonky, right? So the electrical properties of the cell, again, or something, these are two things we have to pay attention to in, in culture. So these are some of the um, myocytes that we've looked at in our lab, and, and I'll talk a bit more about this particular assay that we've been developing. But this is showing a, a myocyte, a frame from a video of a myocyte attached to two of those posts that I showed you before. So then we can measure the force generation of a myocyte uh, by watching the post deflection. And then just a different, you know, looking at staining some of those proteins on a, on a flat surface, so not near the posts. And we get, you know, reasonable structure. The focus isn't so good here, but uh, we get the idea that we're mostly maintaining the structure between the posts, but we still need to work on that, right? This doesn't look as good as this on the flat. And again, this idea of matching the stiffness may be one, one more thing we can, we can play with there. Um, and so we can look, again, at the same thing with the actin organization. So here's another cell that, that is trafficked between some of these posts. And in this case, you know, we see we preserve the actin uh, bundling, we've got sort of the the long axis, we've got, we preserve the potential to do work, in my opinion, because we've got those nice lines, right, in the right orientation. So we want to contract along the long direction there. Um, and so there's just a video. This is um, Alejandro Ribeiro is a postdoc in our lab. And so he's been putting, this is actually myocytes and fibroblasts, and they've made connections to each other. I don't want to interpret this too much, except, you know, to show you the sort of importance of having, again, here we have, um, to some degree, a two-dimensional tissue, right? So this is the fibroblast and the myocytes bridging between the posts with cell-cell contacts, contacts to the posts themselves, and demonstrating the ability to move the posts and, and do work. They're so, doing that on their own? They're doing that on their own. Yeah, so in the case of adult cells, you need to electrically pace them, so with a, almost like a pacemaker in the, in the bath. Um, in the case of neonatal or stem cell derived, they will spontaneously beat, so they'll usually be the presence of a pacemaker cell. Um, and I imagine Joe will probably talk about that tomorrow, but that one pacemaker can set the propagation electromechanical wave. So this was the, I apologize, I really had high aspirations of being able to pull that picture before the talk today, but I'll describe, I described it, right? <laughs> so the, from Chopra, uh, the American Journal of Physiology, Physi Physiology and Circulation, I think, um, they found that by matching the stiffness, we could get the same morphology and it was really nice uh, work. So, and then contractility. So I already showed you this milieu of um, medieval microscale torture devices for cells. Uh, <laughs> and then, <laughs> what, what do we do with them? Uh, so we might take those cells and put them down onto the field of posts, and then we, you know, trace the outline and look at the, basically the post contraction and figure out, you know, the, the posts that are underneath the cell, and then try to map that to, you know, in this case, this is nanonewton, you know, 100 nanonewton peak forces. Notice they're kind of localized at the ends of the cell, which caused us to wonder, you know, is this, is this really the map that we should be getting, or did we just not have good cell to substrate contact in the middle um, in that case? So, you know, there's ways we can start to test that, but um, turns out that from everything we've seen, the cells do want to generate their, their force at their, at their ends, which makes sense, uh, which also means that there's a non-uniform force generation across, across the cells, which is, Got interesting implications. And these are very preliminary data that Dan and I still don't quite know how to interpret because we need more samples. But uh, in terms of the force generation between hypertrophic and normal cells, you know, the, the earliest indications were that the ability of them 
uh, in terms of their, so not so different in fractional shortening, but their force per cross-sectional area um, and their total force being a little bit different, but particularly uh, the, by the shape. So one of the things that we, again, we haven't really restored the morphology because these, these would want to be under preloads. That's something we're actively working on now is to restore that stretch, the, that resting, not resting length, but the, the length they should be at, the sarcomere spacing. And the other thing I want to point out is that to compare all this to macro scale or tissue work, or even heart level, whole organ, um, going into two-dimensional, three-dimensional, we really don't necessarily want a heat map like this. So it, it doesn't translate to a, you know, just two-point force. And so we'd really, in order to be able to compare to these type of um, measurements, so I mentioned the carbon fibers, you and Ashley's lab does, or these high little microgrippers. This gives us just a contractile force between two points. How hard can the cell pull between those two points? So we've done quite a bit to try to understand um, how could we use an assay that, that could be, has potential to be more high throughput. Uh, we're still, you know, need to get a lot more data before we can use words like high throughput, but Rebecca Taylor has been working with us, found a way, uh, found a material, which is pretty neat, to fill in and use it as a sacrificial material. So it's a thermally responsive material. So cells want to be at body temperature, 37 degrees Celsius. And this particular polymer wants to be a solid at 37 degrees, and it wants to wash out and go away when you lower the temperature just by five degrees, below 32 degrees. And so using this method, we can then, you can imagine if you just put the cells down on widespread posts, they would fall down in between them. But using a method like this, they don't want to bind to the yellow, it's unfavorable. We coat these posts with a protein that is favorable, the cells land and preferentially sit between two, sometimes three, we don't know what to interpret with those, but the ones that settle across two posts, we now have only those two points of attachment at the ends where we saw the cells want to do all their work, and then wash away the supporting layer after they're adhered, and then we're left with, with cells across. And that the mechanism is actually just a shape change of this um, P-NIPAM, for, for short. Uh, but it, it's a acrylamide gel-based. Uh, Material, and this has been used over the last couple of decades, you can buy commercially tissue culture dishes that are coated with PNIPAM, and when you change the temperature, you notice these are endothelial cells in culture, so it will loop, but you know, you watch this guy in the middle, it looks like a fried egg. It starts out, you know, all fried egg, all attached. I change the temperature down, the surface is no longer adhesive, no longer favorable for cell binding. Cell retracts and balls up. So this has been very useful to biologists for a lot of other reasons, because often when you want to look at cells, we want to culture them, do some kind of treatment to them, and then in order to analyze them, we want to take them and put them through all kinds of fancy machines like PCR machines and fax machines, and we want to look at their DNA, we want to count them, we want to do different things, we have to get them resuspended. And the way that before these dishes were you know, demonstrated is you had to put in a chemical that enzymatically degraded the cell attachment to the surface, and who knows what that does in lots of other channels to the cell. And so by being able to just change the temperature and make it unfavorable, you lift them off very clean. Um, so Bex leveraged that to be able to uh, make some first measurements on immature cells in a two-point fashion. So these are neonates. So even though people have been patterning neos, neonates and doing a lot with them, they're awfully small, so the number of force measurements with them is, is not so, uh, there's not a lot of data out there to compare to. And as far as we know, these are the only data on human-derived, um, human embryonic stem cell-derived myocytes. Another reason to publish that soon. Uh, <laughs> and the thing that's a little surprising about that, I don't know if anyone is paying attention to scales of forces, but those two-point measurements with carbon fibers um, and other medieval torture devices that stretch cells between two points were micronewtons. And we, in our method, are measuring tens to 100 nanonewtons, so 10x smaller. And there's a lot of reasons that that, that could be occurring. Uh, there's, these measurements are very, very different, so we have not necessarily got a comparable assay right now to the carbon fibers, and so we're actively working with you and Ashley's lab to do one-to-one -one comparisons, but again, we believe part of this may, may be the fact that we aren't providing, in the carbon fibers, you know, you, you can, uh, there's a difference in the sense that you pick up the cell with the carbon fibers, and then you can bring it to a particular displacement and then watch the cell contract around that operating point. We don't have that potential right now. The cells settle in a kind of balled up state. They don't have the ability to spread out any further because of the way we constrain them. So not only do they not have preload, they might actually be artificially shortened 
And so thinking about that Frank Starling law, we may be operating right, you know, way down here and in the carbon fiber, they're operating much higher on the curve. So that's something that we, we want to explore for the differences um, between those. So if we can get our assay up here and get more cells to adhere to a post, then we can compare to the carbon fibers. And it may sound like, well, why reinvent the wheel? The carbon fiber sounds pretty good. Uh, so Ewan has let me in on a, on a secret, which is that there's one block of carbon fibers that no one knows why it works, but when that carbon block is gone, there will be no more carbon fibers that stick to cells. They've tried lots of other carbon fiber blocks and they don't all work. So I don't think we're in danger of um, running out of carbon in the next few years. But the other thing is that this is a very uh, time intensive process, right? So basically let a cell settle, steer your carbon fibers down, pick up that one cell, and then do your test. So you might be able to test one, maybe two cells in a day if you're lucky. So we haven't tuned our assay yet, but our hope, uh, Dan and I, is that by having this assay where we can have thousands of cells settle onto this, we can start to then look at all thousand of them. And so from every animal, we can actually get potentially hundreds or thousands of cells that we can assay and get more population statistics, which are always valuable when trying to understand variability in biological systems. Uh, so I just want to point out one other technique, another student in my lab, Chelsea Simmons, has been trying to develop, um, or has developed and demonstrated, which is, um, again, these these gels with little glowing beads in them, fluorescent beads. And if you watch closely, when the cell contracts, you can see the beads move, right? And so through a, a much more convoluted mechanical analysis, we can back out a, um, a map of the forces it exerts. And so comforting to me is that it's not necessarily an artifact of being attached to just two posts at the end. This is a fully continuous substrate, and the cell still exerts most of its force, right, at the ends of it, which makes work, makes, makes sense. Uh, some of the other questions that we've been debating is if we have a hypertrophy model, or Dan has hypertrophy models, uh, hypertrophy is a disease that, de that develops over time, so the neonatals that are easy to test may not exhibit uh, this hypertrophy. And then if we want to look at sort of hypertrophy in a dish, again, we need the ability to be able to challenge the cells, so one, one mechanism of hypertrophy is this overload. So how do we overload? Well, we'd want to stretch the cells, so something Chelsea has been actively involved with is developing um, test beds we could use to mechanically challenge the cells. So everything I've showed you till now is just measuring, measuring how much force they generate. What happens if we challenge them? So Chelsea and Ji Young have been working on these platforms made out of that silicone again. It looks, a, looks rather complicated, but it's, it's really quite simple. Uh, it has a bunch of little wells that look like 96 well plate culture dishes, so little holes in a plastic dish, except our dish is made of this silicone rubber. And the bottom of it is only about 200 microns thick, so it's very stretchable. And we put it over an array of pillars, stiff pillars. And when the, the, I suck a vacuum down over here in this chamber underneath the pillars, um, I pull the membrane down here and I stretch the membrane that's supported by the host this way. So I apply a stretch to the adhered cells on the surface. So very high tech name, we call it the strain array because we have an array of different strains. Uh, and basically you want to put the cells here in the middle and then look what happens to them as you increase. This is just a map of displacements. So we don't want the cells out here. So first of all, they wash away because we create this little recirculating uh, washing machine out here. We want them in this region where we get a continuous and uniform area of stretch. And so that would be this middle region. So this is from our modeling. We can create regions of uniform strain and by changing the size of the post underneath the membrane, um, you can see what happens is I actually increase the strain in that supported membrane region. And then ideally we would stay away from these edges. And so one of the things Chelsea's been working on is how to confine the cells into the region of, of constant strain. Uh, to validate that this worked, we looked at a type of muscle cell from a, a cell line, very easy to, to care and feed for, even in an engineering lab. And we looked at what happens when we cultivated them and stretched them for six hours, and this was in response to what's called biaxial stretch, right? So the top surface of this membrane is being expanded in the X and the Y, if you can imagine. So two axis stretch. These, this cell type of myoblast is known in the literature to want to align perpendicular to the direction of stretch. So if I stretch this way, the cells will try to minimize the amount of work they have to, uh, what they have to work against. So if I'm stretching this way, the cells will orient this way. Pretty smart, right? Minimize the amount of adjustment they've got to do. So put their long axis that way instead of having to constantly adjust that long one. So on biaxial, we shouldn't have seen anything. But if you look closely, you'll see kind of at the outer regions, you see alignment because the strain goes very um, 
non-biaxial at the edges of the post, so it's actually got a uniaxial component. And this, you know, why is this interesting? It's interesting to us because the cells at the edge, where we have a very high uniaxial strain, orient as expected. And further, this is where the biology gets interesting, they talk to the cells in the center. So that even though the cells in the center have no mechanical alignment cue, their neighbor has one, and it propagates, which is pretty cool. So again, the importance of the cell-cell contacts. Um, and we could also say that you know, there are other ways we, have to, you know, we need to test for that, but luckily in the literature, other people have tested this for us in terms of how far away can cells sense each other and sense mechanically versus chemical factors. And it turns out that mechanical is actually, so the chemical signaling from cell to cell, it's a bit like um, you know, game of telephone or something, right? Dan has to be close enough for the, the little styrofoam cups and the, the piece of yarn you know, to hear me. Uh, the mechanical, you know, someone way in the back, if instead of trying to, to you know, whisper something through the game of telephone, if I just pull on the telephone, you'll feel that, right? Mechanical traffic's really far. So there's been a lot of work that shows that little bits of stretch go really far, 10 cell lengths maybe. Uh, but definitely several cell lengths very strongly. So what, what that means is that you know, we can use this kind of, um, of assay. Uh, it confirmed for us that we want to stay away from here if we don't want unintentional mechanical signaling. But what Chelsea's uh, done is come up with a way to pattern those gels with the beads in them just in the center. And then we're now in the process of looking at what's the effect of, can we, do, we can either do biaxial or uniaxial strains in these devices. And so uh, another student in our lab, Beth Martin, asked the question of um, what about that protein, right? Cells stick by sticking to the protein we put on the surface. Does the protein we put on the surface of the strain already matter? So we looked at different proteins and just to give you an idea, you know, so these would be, these receptors are typical integrin cell ECM contact receptors. Laminin is something that would be commonly seen in the, the membrane of the heart. Fibronectin receptors uh, made by fibroblast deposited, uh, a, a, a very much a fibroblast deposited protein. And then gelatin, you know, just think jello. Matra gel, think jello from um, a, an animal, <laughs> which I guess jello is actually too. But uh, gel so gelatin being more like, you know, from cow hoof type gelatin, and matra gel being from actually kind of gross a tumor. So it is, it is made from, from tumors. And it has, because it's made from tumors, it has an, a soup of growth factors and chemical cues that cells love to grow on. So it's a kind of control. It's used all the time for cell culture. Uh, I really don't think we're going to go anywhere near tissue engineering applications with matrigel. So there's a lot of effort on making artificial matrices. This is actually from our collaborator, Sarah Hauschel, and engineers uh, materials with the, the same receptors that, say, the laminin or the fibronectin would have. So what's the upshot of here? Essentially, what she's plotting here is it's not really cell adhesion. It should be cell area. How well do cells spread on these different, different proteins? Um, and does it matter in terms of like the size of the area they have in terms of the well, the, the supported area of the membrane? Um, maybe not surprisingly, because matrigel gel is a nice soft material and these cells would want to be on something soft. So just for reference, uh, I'll give you a few numbers. The paper that said neonate myocytes spread beautifully, the number is 10 kilopascal, 10 kPa is where they are beautiful. That's sort of muscle stiffness. So that's 10 kPa. The polymer that we're using for this device, one megapascal. So that's 1,000 kPa. So we're way, you know, now, we now know that, but way out of spec for that, which is part of the reason why Chelsea's putting the gels on top of the, of the, the, the pillars. And then we can get those gels, we can tune their stiffness. But even here, matrigel, gel, um, not not tuned to 10 kPa, major gel is probably more like 100 pascals, one-tenth of a, of a kPa, right? So kind of where do we need to be for how the cells would want to spread? And again, this, that, these, are, these C2 sutols are not neonate myocytes, so you know, what is the right stiffness they should be on? Seems to me that whatever the stiffness of matrigel gel is is where they, what they like to be on. So that, to us, says that we need to put a buffer layer, a gel underneath there, and then put different factors of adhesion. So the, the experiment will work, but the cells won't look as happy as they could um, if they're not spread correctly. So the second experiment Beth did was to look at that realignment again, except this time we put the whole system, instead of being biaxial, made the whole system uniaxial. So we can try to avoid that artifact at the end. Um, and interestingly, kind of the counterpoint to this is, while the cells spread much better for this cell type, which is not a cardiac cell type, it's just a thing we're testing, 
on the matrix gel, they did not align as well on the matrix gel as they did on the other proteins. And that makes sense because the matrix gel is now acting like a buffer, right? So think about kind of trying to transfer strain through jello, right? Versus transferring strain through um, maple syrup, right? And the matrix gel is somewhere in between those two. And so when we think about the PDMS, maybe more like the jello, it is able to transfer the strain better. And so the protein that's very, you know, a few nanometers thick on top of the elastomers, transferring the strain and exhibiting better alignment. So if we want to mechanically test cells, we need to balance, basically. So it's something to think about in terms of that, that matching. Um, I'm going to skip over that. And I think we'll, I, I can, we'll stop there, maybe. So just to summarize, because we're out of time. <laughs> I've got sort of more pretty pictures if you're interested later. but. Um, but I think that's kind of a good point to, to stop, is that we do know that all of these things can matter, and you know, we're, we're kind of moving towards what we hope is a high-throughput assay that can be used both for understanding the physiology and eventually for drug testing or maybe platforms for tissue engineering, so we understand how it is cells want to uh, rebuild themselves and rebuild tissues. So, give you questions. <laughs> The question was, what are the timelines for this to be useful? By what useful, I mean, I guess you're thinking that you, this is an option a doctor might offer to you? Yeah. Okay. So for regenerative therapies, uh, as I alluded to in some countries, there are clinical trials already for stem, just stem cells, so not sort of tissue engineered patches yet. Um, I think the, that CIRM, the California Institute of Regenerative Medicine, just funded a sort of early phase trial or going towards a trial for a, a large company here in California with stem cells. Uh, I don't know at what point they would be doing a, a clinical trial. But even, even if those trials went smashingly, um, and Dan probably can comment more on this, thinking about drug testing clinical trials, if everything went perfectly in that first round of drug testing, you're probably still talking about years of, of the follow-on testing before you're, you're looking at a product you can distribute as a, a pharmaceutical. Uh, so the stem cell stuff is, in my opinion, more than a decade away um, for most, most applications. I think, as Dr. Wu will tell you next week, um, there are uh, currently many, many uh, trials of bone marrow derived and other circulating cells that are being injected into people's hearts. Um, but they're not probably what most of us would really call stem cells, and that is they're, oh, very different kinds of cells that probably don't have the capacity, at least we don't believe, to actually regenerate normal muscle cells. The interesting thing is that they actually seem to do something beneficial. Not very much, but they do. And so the question is, and Beth talked a little bit about extracellular matrix and the proteins that cells make. It may be that you can take a cell, in a bone marrow cell, for example, or a blood vessel, a, a cell that's circulating in your bloodstream, inject it into the heart, and some of the chemicals or the proteins that that cell makes are capable of urging the other muscle cells in your heart uh, in order to function better. Um, there is some data that suggests that there is a niche of cells in the heart called cardiac stem cells, very controversial, and I think Joe will touch on this next week, um, and that those cells are actually what get stimulated to divide when you give all these therapies. So the answer at this one is this is a field that is moving very quickly. It is still extremely controversial, and when Beth and I started working together, the, one of, again, the first questions that I asked is, if you put something into my heart, guarantee to me that it works, that it's capable of doing work and not just sitting there and causing problems like making tumors or causing abnormal heart rhythm. And that's part of the reason why uh, we're doing all the biomechanics to better understand what, in fact, we're gonna put into people one day. Yeah, and it's worth uh, noting, I know I've heard Phil Yang talk on this as well. A lot of the studies that have been published are pretty short term, so they follow patients for weeks, a few months. And there was another study a few years ago um, that showed if you injected saline into the heart as opposed to cells in suspension, you got the same benefit for a few months because you're essentially stiffening the myocardium by injecting this bolus of fluid, and so the, the heart is able to become uh, more efficient for a short period of time. And Phil has shown some, some data of longer term studies, six months, that, 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 so that effect actually starts to go away in some of the stem cell studies. I'm not saying all, all of them are, but it is, it is something to be aware of. That, that each study that gets done is, you know, the first one is maybe for 
following patients for a week or following them for three months, and then it's six months, and then it's a year, and three years. And this is kind of, this is part of the FDA requirements of bringing a, a, clinic, a medical product to market, um, is that you kind of sneak up on this. Um, I think there's a, a nice example of a company called Second Sight that has a retinal implant, restores sight in the blind on a limited basis. It's just an electrode array that stimulates uh, for certain types of blindness it will work. And their course of validation is, you know, again, this kind of three months, six months, one year, and they, I think they just finished their trials where patients had them for, I don't know if it was one to three years or something, and then it's, you know, mandated the end of this clinical trial, and now we must take back that implant, we must look at it and see how it's doing. Um, and you can imagine that that's, there's no failures, there's no failures of that implant, and what, what that's like for someone who had some limited sight restored for a three-year clinical trial to have that taken away, it's, it's a real difficult um, problem for, for doctors and patients and, and FDA to, to balance, but at the same time, it's kind of the right thing to do to ensure, you know, there was a question by someone earlier about the hip implants and how, how do we know and how, why couldn't they have predicted that? And, you know, unfortunately, it is this kind of just ever-increasing length of duration of, and finding the things, the unknown unknowns. So the question is, uh, <laughs> at what age do uh, heart cells stop growing? That, that, again, is a subject of another hour of lecture. <laughs> so, what I, so what I was taught, um, not all that long ago, uh, when I started my cardiology training, is that heart muscle cells probably stop dividing somewhere in the first six weeks of life. That was based on some rodent studies. Um, so if you imagine, your heart is about the size of your fist. So in a little baby, the heart is about yay big, okay? In a, six week old, it's probably about that big, and that all growth of the heart between this size and this size, um, as you grow older and become an adult, is based on cells getting larger, but no new cells forming. Um, and that essentially, once you lost a cell, if a cell died, it was gone forever. And those are, that's what's called a terminally differentiated cell. It's a cell that's gone along the line from being a cell that's capable of becoming anything to a cell that it can only be a myocyte and will never, ever divide or be anything else. That has been challenged <clears throat> um, over the last 10 years, predominantly by a, a group of investigators um, led by a guy named Piero Inversa, who first noted that if you look at techniques which label cells that are dying, you could take a normal heart on any one of us and do that labeling and you would see that there are some cells that are undergoing this kind of cell death called apoptosis. Very small number, one-tenth of one percent. But if that's happening every day of your life, after age 30, you wouldn't have a heart left. So he made the argument that there's got to be some mechanism for cells to be replaced. That work had been quite controversial up until fairly recently, maybe within the last four or five years, there was a neat study done where, um, so during the t uh, nuclear t above ground testing, there were increased amounts of carbon-14 in the atmosphere. Carbon-14 came down, and make sure, I'm, am I getting the right isotope here? Yeah, carbon-14 carbon, okay. carbon 14, ca coming down, um, getting in, in, into the food chain, people drinking milk, um, that you know, cows eat the grass, uh, kids drink the milk. And so if you actually look at somebody who was born and lived during the period of above ground nuclear testing, the amount of carbon-14 atoms in, in their cell constituents is slightly different from someone who was born and grew up before then or after the nuclear testing stopped. And so this wonderful study, what they did is they looked at the cell so they could actually tell whether or not a cell developed during that window of time or whether or not it got added later. Because if it got added in the 1980s or 1970s, it didn't have that increased ratio of C14 to C12. And what they actually showed is that the rate of division of cells in your body starts out at about 1% a year for the first maybe 10 to 20 years of your life and then, and then decreases. So that over a 70 year lifetime, <clears throat> they calculated about half the cells in your heart get replaced. But the other half don't. So that most of the cells in your heart right now are the cells you were born with that have just gotten larger over time. The secret that we're trying to unlock, the holy grail of cardiac regeneration, 
is to make those cells remember how to divide and become cells that can become other cells again. Other people think that there are these little nests of cells called cardiac stem cells which sit in some protected areas in the heart and that are kind of quiet in the background, dividing at a very slow rate over time, but that when you have a heart attack or you have an injury to the heart, they get revved up and can begin to divide more, but they still don't replace the heart muscle cells fast enough in order to repair and make the heart work again. And that's where if you inject stem cells or saline or whatever, you may be stimulating those cells rather than having, you know, rather than the, the, the stem cells actually becoming heart muscle cells. And yet, that's what, it's a perfect lead in to what Joe is gonna talk about next week. Yet a relatively, kind of, relatively similar amount of blood flow during most situations and conditions. The organs that have the ability to change their blood flow rapidly are the muscle, the skin and the uh, and the viscera, the intestines. So when you eat a meal, the blood flow to your intestines goes way up because you need blood flow to both metabolize the food and move it from your intestines elsewhere. But when you're not eating, um, the, the blood flow is fairly low. Um, the same thing with your muscles. Uh, muscle blood flow is at a certain level, but if you go out and jog, your muscle blood flow goes up dramatically. That's controlled by blood vessels in those organs that either dilate or contract um, based on a number of endocrine signals and on nerves that are sitting in, in those vessels. The brain and the heart act very differently. And the brain and the heart will get as much blood flow as they need to meet their metabolic needs at baseline no matter what. In fact, they will steal blood from other parts of the body in order, so when you go into shock, for example, if you're hemorrhaging or you're infected, if you go into shock, the brain and the heart continue to get blood at the expense of every other organ in the body. The kidneys will shut down, the intestines will shut down, the peripheral muscle, if you've ever seen, if you see someone in shock, they're freezing cold, but the heart and the brain will continue to get the blood flow they need until pretty much the heart can't do it anymore. So the workload gets redistributed between different organs based on what's called the sympathetic nervous system, the ability of blood vessels to either constrict or to, or to relax. You know, in terms of the biomechanical loading and how that affects the cardiovascular system, I don't know how much that's been and yeah, I mean, that, sort of the best studies I could think of would be, you know, folks look with uh, scanning studies at, at uh, where zones of, or regions of the brain are, are activated, but I don't know they've been correlated to blood flow so much, or, you know, like in the case of migraines and, and such, but I'm not sure. If, yeah. But there are devices, and we use them clinically, uh, using a, a technique called near infrared spectroscopy, NEARS devices, that actually you just put on the top of the, the scalp on someone who's undergoing surgery, for example, that measure the amount of oxygen being used by the brain, and so give us an index of how much flow is going to the brain. And that allows an anesthesiologist, for example, doing an open heart surgery procedure to adjust the medications the patient's on to make sure that they're guaranteeing adequate flow to the brain. I think last week somebody asked a question about pump head, and that's a phenomenon after open heart surgery where people, their cognition isn't totally normal. We think that we can reduce that by paying more careful attention to how much blood flow and oxygen the brain is getting during surgery. So there are techniques, and that's, I mean, those nearest devices, my guess is there's some form of MEMS device um, that are, are very exquisite sensors that can then adjust um, to the uh, signal that they're getting very, very rapidly. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.